make these things for people my height. Oh, hold on. So, okay, I'm trying to think how to situate this so I'm not completely buried back here. Can I do this? Um, in 2010, a trio of researchers from the University of British Columbia published a paper that challenged the way the social sciences have for a century made really broad generalizations about human nature and behavior based on research that is solely conducted on what they called weird societies. And weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. <laughs> so these guys reviewed a comparative database from across the behavioral sciences, and what they found was that weird societies not only are not representative of humanity as a whole, they are in fact among the least representative populations one could find for generalizing about humans. Um, by many measures, Americans are farther out on the bell curve than Europeans, so they, in other words, they're outliers among outliers. And interestingly, a lot of these outlying traits pertain to the type of education that we have come to think of as normal in weird societies. All, <laughs> all social mammals have evolved species-specific behaviors for learning and transmitting the skills that they're gonna need to, to survive as adults. And our own species evolved over hundreds of thousands of years in small, mixed-age communities where children are embedded in adult activity. They're surrounded by older and younger children, young adults, grandparents. They're immersed in the natural world. They are free to play, move, exercise their bodies. They're free to uh, follow their curiosity, to explore, to experiment, to tinker and they're able to observe, imitate, and then participate in adult work as they become developmentally ready. A baiga father in the forests of India knows that if a child tries something and then backs away, you leave him alone. He'll be back to try again later. A Yupik elder knows that young children learn better from story than from lecture, from real life experience than from verbal instruction. Um, a foray parent from Papua New Guinea knows that children learn a lot of things much better by emulating older children rather than being taught by adults. And a Maori mother knows that children don't develop in a straight upward progression, but in a kind of stair-step pattern with long plateaus followed by sudden leaps forward. So people all over the world know these things about children and learning, and a lot more than that. And interestingly, though, these approaches are as workable for learning how to conduct a scientific experiment or design software or write an elegant essay as they are for learning to hunt caribou or identify medicinal plants in a rainforest. If you talk to gifted scientists, artists, writers, entrepreneurs, you are going to very often find that they did most of their learning the way a Warani child in the Amazon learns through experimentation, keen observation, immersion, freedom, the kind of, through, through real play and real work, through the kind of free activity where the distinction between work and play disappears. Talk to a really good auto mechanic, carpenter, farmer, fiddle player, web designer, photographer, chef, you're gonna very often find that they learned the same way. So any wildlife biologist knows that an animal in a zoo will not develop normally if the environment is incompatible with the evolved species, um, the evolved social needs of its species. But we no longer know this about ourselves. We have radically altered our own evolved species behavior by artificially segregating children in same age peer groups uh, during the day, by expecting them to be indoors and sedentary for most of the day by asking them to learn from artificial text-based materials instead of contextualized real-world activities, and by dictating arbitrary timetables for learning instead of following the unfolding of a child's developmental readiness. Common sense should tell us that all of this is going to have complicated and unpredictable results, and in fact, 
It does, while some children seem able to function in this completely artificial environment, really significant numbers of them cannot. And around the world, every day, millions and millions of normal, bright, healthy children are labeled as failures in ways that damage them for life. And increasingly, those who can't adapt to the artificial environment of school are diagnosed as brain disordered and drugged. It is in this context that our fearless leaders in the US Education Department and other experts in positions of authority make really broad statements about how children learn and how best to teach them. But making generalizations about how children learn based on their behavior in school is like making generalizations about killer whales based on their behavior at SeaWorld. So one of the weirdest characteristics of education in our society, there are a lot of them, but one of the very weirdest, um, a lot of indigenous people from around the world will tell you, is that our approach to education is extraordinarily authoritarian. It is obsessed with compulsion and control. So the child in a modern classroom may not move, speak, sing, laugh, eat, drink, read, write, think her own thoughts, look out the window, or even use the toilet without explicit permission from an authority figure. The teacher has control over the child, the district and the state have control over the teacher. Increasingly, systems of national standards and funding are now creating control over the state. And in what should be considered a very chilling development, there are murmurings now of creating globalized standards for education, for the creation of a single global authority dictating what every child on the planet has to learn. So the problem with this scenario should be obvious. Who gets to decide what the, ch the world's children are gonna learn? And just as important, who decides what they are not gonna learn? Who decides they have to learn algebra but not permaculture? Who decides they have to know the periodic table but not the provisions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Because while your kids are very busy toiling over algebra and chemistry, international trade agreements are being forged and currencies are being manipulated by entities that most Americans do not even know the names of, much less the inner workings of. And while um, you know, children in the developing world, the so-called developing world, are struggling with you know, English romantic poets and the high school physics, you know, uh, the IMF and the World Bank are negotiating incentives for foreign investments that are resulting in their ancestral lands being sold out from under them uh, to foreign timber mining companies, energy companies, and Wall Street speculators in agri agricultural land. So in weird societies, we are so habituated to this appalling lack of personal freedom that it has become functionally invisible to us. And in a truly Orwellian twist, many people now consider it a fundamental human right to be legally compelled to learn what somebody in authority says they have to learn. So, but the idea of centrally controlled education is as problematic as the idea of a centrally controlled press, and for exactly the same reasons. So I think there's a crucial confusion in our society between the idea of publicly supported education and the idea of centrally controlled state administered education, which as everyone in this room knows, increasingly means corporate controlled education. So if you wanna get your hands around this distinction, just replace the word school with the word radio, and I'll ask you two questions if you can have a show of hands. How many people in this room are in favor of publicly supported community radio? How many people in this room are in favor of centrally controlled state administered radio? <laughs> so there's a big distinction between these two things, but we're so, we're so used to it that many of us can't really see the alternative. So I just wanna suggest a little thought experiment. What if we took our existing local school and instead of trying to reform it from the top down through bureaucratic means, we simply removed the element of compulsion. What if we allowed our schools to operate the way human beings 
have structured their social learning relationships for 100,000 years based in freedom, autonomy, consent, and cooperation instead of in compulsion and control. So that means no compulsory attendance, no compulsory curriculum, no compulsory grading and testing. So what would happen if we just just took that one piece out, you know, would all hell break loose? Well, you know, I would suggest that at first, in most cases, if you removed the element of compulsion tomorrow, nothing very radical would happen. I used to do wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, and one of the things that we all knew is that once you had kept an animal in a confined condition for long enough, you can open the door and they won't go out. You know, they're just, they're very tentative and fearful and of the unknown. So um, most people would probably just keep doing what they're doing. But slowly, you know, a few things might start to happen. A few couple teenagers might break away and create self-designed uh, learning programs, or they might set up apprenticeships or volunteer work or um, paid work in the community. <coughs> Maybe groups of kids would get together to make a documentary film or plant a garden. Maybe a little group of parents of the kids diagnosed with ADHD would say, look, okay, there has to be some way we can figure out to have our kids run around outside more during the day. Maybe somebody would organize a writing workshop or a photography workshop or a sustainability study group that could include both teenagers and adults from the community. Maybe writers or farmers or chefs from the community would come into the school and start to share their skills. So slowly the school starts to become permeable to the community. Adults start coming in, both as students and as mentors, and students start going out as apprentices and as participants in community activities. So instead of a compulsory state-administered institution where we segregate children from life, we slowly begin to evolve toward an open, publicly supported community learning center. The school becomes a gathering place for the whole community, a place for conversations, for collaboration, as Illich would have said, for conviviality, instead of for compulsion and control. So we suddenly realize, you know, right here in our neighborhood, we have this really large building. Okay, it's usually a really ugly building which is something that always bothers me, that we often are keeping our children in the ugliest building in town during the day. But it's still a really large building with lots of rooms. We have an auditorium where we can do plays and concerts and lectures. We have science labs. We have a woodworking shop. We have a gymnasium. We have art studios. We have a library. We could have science labs that go on all afternoon for the kids that really love science. We could have, we have our community garden. We could, we could get goats. We could make goat cheese because we have this huge you know, industrial kitchen and we could have cooking classes and big community dinners and we could set up a student-run coffee shop so students could learn how to run a business while they're still um, teenagers. We could have a student-run gallery space where they sell you know, art and wood, student-created art and woodworking. We could have a maker space. We could have a bike repair shop. So, um, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what about the Common Core Standards? <laughs> Somebody thinking that? Somebody worried about the Common So the important thing to realize is that somebody in your community is going to be worried about the Common Core Standards. Some people, no matter what great ideas you have, are going to continue to want a very conventional education for their kids. And if you try to take that away from them, you're going to start a war. And by the way, you will lose that war. So you have to envision this a community learning center that is diverse. That means you may have one group of kids who are doing a full-time traditional academic program. You might have another group of kids doing an innovative learner-directed program. And you're going to have other kids that are out of the school and, you know, um, apprenticing or unschooling in the community and just coming in for the filmmaking workshop or the permaculture class. So it's a big blind spot for progressives sometimes. I think the goal is not to gain control of the school and use it to control other people. The goal is to remove the institutional barriers to flexibility, change, adaptation, evolution, diversity, to turn the system from a dead mechanical structure into a living organism that can evolve and adapt to the diverse needs of children and communities.